Ashdown Forest in Sussex is Winnie the Pooh country, and it takes A. A. Milne to describe it adequately. By the time it came to the edge of the forest, the stream had grown up, so that it was almost a river. And being grown up, it did not run and jump and sparkle along as it used to do when it was younger, but moved more slowly. For it knew now where it was going, and it said to itself, there's no hurry, we shall get there someday. But all the little streams higher up in the forest went this way and that, quickly, eagerly, having so much to find out before it was too late. Ashdown Forest was originally created as a royal hunting ground. Its 14,000 acres of wooded heathland are ablaze in season with heather, gorse and bracken. The land rises to 700 feet at Beacon Hill and three rivers, the Medway, the Ouse and the East Rother, emerge from its sterile and sandy soil. In September, the forest is curiously silent as the birds are too busy moulting or feeding up for long migrations to sing as they did back in the summer. In 1662, many trees were cut down to improve the sport for the royal stag hunters. Some village names like Hartfield, where A. A. Milne lived and wrote the Pooh stories, and Buckhurst, echo the distant stag hunting days. Although it is in the midst of the stockbroker belt and local accents have largely disappeared, Ashdown Forest still retains much tranquility and dignity. genuine country people have managed to hang on in spite of the rocketing prices of local property. The constant stream of heavy and fast-moving traffic along the unfenced roads is a hazard for deer, sheep and of course hedgehogs. Margaret Wilcox's flock of fine goats are hardly typical of the livestock of the area, but they're all in a day's work for vet Christine Howe, whose practice includes the whole of Ashdown Forest. We're a very mixed, mixed practice. Do everything from aquariums to rabbitries to, well, goats. I myself do nearly all cattle work, work with dairy cows most of the time, and oh, quite a lot of horses. And she hasn't been scouring at all? No, absolutely nothing. It's a, a knack. One learns how to deal with these big animals. If one didn't, you'd soon be out of business. I suppose I've been brought up with cattle and with horses all my life, and you just get a, a way of dealing with them. Occasionally you get stroppy ones that you have to sedate or use other methods, but even rabbits can be a problem. They've got very good claws. Okay. And would it be right. any point giving her a multi-bit jab? I think, it, yes, I think it probably would be a, a good idea. This part of the world seems to, it has a hold on you somehow. Oh, let her go. She's a good girl. There's, there's an awful lot of, all the different types of landscape. There's the forest, there's the downs, there's the, the woods, there's coastland, there's everything here. 
There's people from all walks of life. You've got everything from the country farmer to the stockbroker to the millionaire virtually around here. Okay, My one dislike of the area is that there are too many people. Although we found the birds elusive during our filming week, we discovered a captive audience of every kind of feathered creature at Sheffield Park on the edge of Ashdown Forest. There, Don Harrison and his wife have dedicated their lives to rescue and care for injured and unwanted birds of every colour of the rainbow. Well, our busiest time of the year is coming up, which is normally um, December, January and February when we get the gales and then we get the vast numbers of oiled seabirds which are always a great problem to us. We don't really take any decision to put any bird down unless it is suffering. If it can enjoy its life in any form, if it's only one wing and it can enjoy its life, we do not put it down, we let it live. Well, we get a vast range of birds in the summer months because we get the effect of the small garden birds from people that uh, use insecticides or pesticides heavily in their gardens. Of the owls, I would think on a whole, we say, well, well over 80%. Probably about 5% or 6% die. There are another 4 or 5% which we do have to put down. Um, probably 10% aren't fit for rehabilitation and we find homes for those or keep them here ourselves for educational purposes. It is between 70 and 80% that go back to the wild. The other thing that astonishes me is to see so many obviously exotic birds, birds from a long, long way away, the macaws and so on. How do you come by those? Well, uh, various circumstances. I think in the main that noise is a big problem. People buy them and they don't realise and their neighbours complain about the amount of noise that a cockatoo will make. It's much noisier than a dog. Um, and then there are problems indoors because if you get a parrot or macaw indoors, he would soon destroy indoors and it isn't fair to keep him shut up in his cage. Um, and then there are the problem of people going overseas, uh, this sort of thing, and they bring them here, often till they come back or they bring them here for sanctuary. We've just lost one macaw, but she was well over 100 years old, but the majority lived 50, 60, 70, 80 years. People don't really realise what they're taking on when they take a bird. It's far more trouble than a dog or a cat. We get a great many young children do bring birds in, and we pay special attention to them because when the child comes back in two or three weeks and he sees the bird outside in the aviary or he can release it, you've got a conservationist in life. Forest ranger John Linton spends some of his time teaching children how to care for the woods and heathland which are his responsibility. He sometimes takes them to the bridge where Pooh Bear invented the game of Pooh Sticks. One day Pooh, Piglet and Rabbit and Roo were all playing Pooh Sticks together. They had dropped their sticks in when Rabbit said, Go! 
then they had hurried across to the other side of the bridge. And now they were all leaning over the edge, waiting to see whose stick would come out first. But it was a long time coming, because the river was lazy that day and hardly seemed to mind if it didn't ever get there at all. Yeah. Now it's got absolutely superb seeds. It's got seeds that spit out. Now if we reach for a one of it, now watch carefully. So when you turn them out of line and touch them, you see, and that spits its oh, this one went. spitting its seeds out so that it spreads itself around and that's the best way around. Yeah. I come down here often, down to Pooh Bridge quite a bit. And you read read the stories that go with Pooh Bridge. Yeah. All the ones. You've seen Eeyore going by, I mean okay playing poo sticks, but how about <laughs> poor old Eeyore falling in? No, we haven't seen him yet. <laughs> And what, what else do you do down there? You pick blackberries, I know that. Yeah. Are they good ones? Yeah, well, the ones I just said were tasty. predictably popular in Ashdown Forest, and horses are everywhere. Sean Williams keeps four of her own, but her business is to make and repair harness and horse rugs for the riders of the forest. I've always worked with horses, and I've always loved horses, and everything to do with them. And I don't remember actually starting, but I must have done sometime. Well, we have um, between three and five hundred horses riding on the forest. And uh, I get a lot of their custom, so that keeps me out of mischief. Roads and horses do not mix, which is why I'm so glad we have the forest here. Horses can be very unpredictable on the road. It only takes a little white bag or something to frighten them. I don't think people realise just how quickly they can move across a road. Well, it is quite hard work especially harness work. It can be very tough stuff. In general, it's very interesting. I try and do some different things. I repair handbags and I've been asked to make some leather skirts. And um, I've done repairs to motorbike leathers and um, altered them. When I'm looking at a bridle for quality, I look at see if it's been edged properly, which means that it's not sharp on your hands, it's not sharp on your horse, and um, that the edges are polished nicely and good fittings. There's quite a lot to making bridles. You've got to cut the leather first and edge it, and uh, stamp your holes however many to the inch you're going to put your stitching. And there's polishing, there's quite a lot of work goes into one bridle actually and people don't realize and I sometimes regret that people can't tell the difference between a well-made bridle and a not so good bridle. We can get some cheaper English stuff too but if people look carefully they can see the difference. Sean's hobby is playing the harp. parents both went out to buy me a rocking horse for Christmas and in one of the shops which is a junk shop was the harp and uh, my mother bought it for my father as a surprise and he's restored it it's a very old harp it's a lovely instrument
Even on the murkiest September day, there's work for Paul and Marion Wilcock on their unique farm at Witch Cross. Their enterprise is devoted to keeping alive rare breeds of farm animals and poultry, the sort of animals that were a common sight on peasant farms in the Middle Ages. We lived here for a, down at the other side of the forest. We wanted more land for the animals. We were collecting more animals than we could keep. And we liked the area. It was hard. The ground isn't particularly good, so we get a very sparse grass growth. So that the old breeds off the mountains don't grow fat. They stay in their natural form, their old-fashioned form. The Wensleydale sheep, which come from Yorkshire, they have great long coats, very silky, bred for long fleeces and for a particular quality of fleece years ago, now very low in numbers. They have a 180% lambing rate and they're being used for crossing to increase fertility and lambing rate. Also that fleece grows a millimetre a day, which means by the end of a year you've got over a foot of fleece on most ewes and a shearling could have 18 inches of fleece on it. Come on, Jeff. Those are rather lovely. They're the smallest of all the British breeds, and in fact they're a feral sheep, which means they're almost wild, so they're quite difficult to, to handle. Um, the thing that most people don't realise about them is that they don't have a fleece which you can shear like you do with normal fleeces. They're, you actually pluck the wool out. They've discovered, in fact, that they're so light on their feet that they're suitable for grazing on reclaimed land, so particularly in Cornwall, where they're reclaiming the old uh, clay china pits. The Gloucester cattle, until very recently, nearly became extinct. They lost favour to the Frisians, and now the only ones that are kept alive are kept by alive by enthusiasts like us, and by one commercial herd, which is producing milk specifically for double Gloucester cheese, which was their original purpose in life. The British White is a big success story, I think, of, um, of the rare breeds. In about 1980, there were something like 285, and there are now well over 400 um, pure registered British whites. Um, they're being used very much more for crossing with dairy breeds to produce beef cows. It's not until you've nearly lost your breed that you realise that they've got qualities which hadn't previously been appreciated. The big bronze turkeys I love, those are destined for breeding. They're not going to be on anybody's table for Christmas but they would be a superb turkey if they were put on the table. They would be a nice gamey, much stronger meat than commercial turkey. All our pigs are hardy, and so indeed are the Vietnamese pot-bellied pigs, the little black ones. I don't know very much about the background of how they came, came to England, but I'm told by people who have been out in the Far East that they are identical to the little black pigs that they have running around in the Far East at the moment. This year we've decided that as they're hardy, we try the old traditional way of housing them, which is an old straw house. So the other day we sort of um, made them what we thought was a very beautiful straw house, and obviously the first time we didn't get it quite right, because when we came down the next morning, there was just a big heap of straw with little pigs with their heads sticking out the top, and all you could see were just little eyes across here. But they, they were quite happy. Just as well there were no big bad wolves about from that point of view. <laughs> That's right. Fred Kirby is one of the Ashdown Forest old-timers. He's called the wood or manor reeve and his job is to look after and to control the cutting of heather and wood and the digging of stone. Above all, he loves the area and its trees and views. Well, I think the autumn is my favourite time when the trees are all changing colour and the heather's out and, and especially I have an interest in the heather because I'm a beekeeper, you see and uh, the bees get a lot of honey from the other, so that's my one of my uh, main objects of like in the autumn. When we were children, you see, there wasn't the amount of people about, and you could walk about, but today, uh, every little crook and corner there's a car parked in, or somebody caught in, or something like that, you see. Well, it does get a bit harsh at times if you get a bad winter, 
it used to be more commoners' home, you know, but today uh, it's overspill from London practically all the time, you see. One time a, you, you'd see a commoner going out getting his firewood for light the fire and perhaps his wife hanging out to wash it on a line on the forest, but you don't see that today. What can a commoner do that you or I can't? Well, I can do what a commoner can do because I am a you're commoner. Com you're a commoner yourself. Yeah. You couldn't go out onto the forest and cut birch, willow or alder because your land where you live hasn't got common rights. Well, Jim, I suppose you wonder where I got this stick. Well, it uh, is a three-purpose stick. And when you're going through the brakes, if they're wet, you see you can poke them one side. And sometimes I've had, I had one occasion when an Alsatian rushed at me. So it's just right for parrying them off, you see. Now you grab that stick. And if a man rushes at you, see, you've got a second defence. <laughs> oh, nasty too, isn't it? My yeah. goodness me. Oh, how smashing. That's what, that the, what the old original rangers used to have. That was the only thing they could carry, you see. This is all back in the days when they were highwaymen and all yes. sorts of things. Oh, yes. We, we, we're walking underneath absolutely splendid beech trees. Yeah. Can, can somebody come in and say, I, I want to pay you to chop one of these down? No. No, because <clears throat> there's a preservation order on the trees of the forest. Beech, reseed yourself. See these uh, beech nuts drop. It's amazing how far the squirrels and pigeons carry them away before they drop them. Then they germinate. Now, so you get a beech tree or an oak tree coming up, perhaps where there's never been a tree before. In normal circumstances, Fred Kirby should have the last word. But in Ashdown Forest, that has to go to A.A. A. Milne and to Christopher Robin and Pooh. By and by, they came to an enchanted place on the very top of the forest called Galleon's Lap. Being enchanted, its floor was not like the floor of the forest, gorse and bracken and heather, but close-set grass, quiet and smooth and green. It was the only place in the forest where you could sit down carelessly without getting up again almost at once and looking for somewhere else. Sitting there, they could see the whole world spread out until it reached the sky. And whatever there was, all the world over, was with them in Galleon's lap. <laughs> 